but from what I've seen is that following Auntie Diaries um, and the controversy that the song has, has sparked, there have been several calls for Kendrick to be canceled. Um, and I understand the rationale behind that. But unfortunately, I think that has sort of derailed what could have been a, a moment of reflection and what could have been a meaningful conversation. So now we have people who are calling for Kendrick to be canceled and we have other people defending Kendrick and saying he shouldn't be canceled because he's, he's spoken on trans issues and he's proven himself to be an ally. And you have this back and forth happening between different camps. And I think that's actually derailed the conversation because now trans people are no longer at the forefront. Now what's at the forefront of people's mind is do we cancel Kendrick or not? What's at the forefront of people's mind is a celebrity rather than the emotional well-being of a marginalized group of people. Hi Daniel, welcome to A Brace for Conversations. Um, in this episode, I want to speak to you about the latest Kendrick Lamar album. Um, I want to hone into the track um, Anti Diaries. Um, I want to discuss the implications it has for the LBGTQ community. Um, but before I get there, please tell us who you are. Okay, so my name is Danielle Hofmeister. Um, I am a project leader at the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation. I work in the Sustained Dialogues program of the organization um, on a project called Youth Identity. I work with young people across the Western Cape, uh, Free State, as well as Northwest on issues related to belonging versus exclusion, um, justice, social justice, particularly identity, reconciliation, and dignity. All right, thank you very much. Um, so, Thank you for that. So let's jump into uh, the next kind of segment and, and the reason why we are here. Um, what do you think of the latest Kendrick Lamar album? I think it's an exceptionally good piece of, of art. I think the album touches on several important issues that are I think universal to the black experience. So issues related to intergenerational trauma, uh, violent or toxic enactments, enactments of masculinity, uh, fractured families, mental health, all of these issues. Um, issues related to healing as well and, and seeking healing through therapy, which remain very controversial issues in the black community. Um, I think it touches on all of these in, in seemingly sensitive ways and in others maybe less sensitive ways. So altogether, I think it's an important piece of, of art. Right, thank you for, thank you for that. Um, so what do you think is some of the standout tracks for you? And why do you choose these tracks? So to be honest, the first um, track that I listened to was We Cry Together. Um, and I remember listening to it because I, I saw it was being mentioned on Twitter. A number of my mutuals had tweeted about the song. And some were saying that um, it's a kind of song that you can't listen to in public. You have to listen to it in the privacy of your home with your earphones in for extra precaution. And there was a lot of mentions being made to We Cry Together. And I was intrigued by the song. So I thought, I'm going to listen to it. And when I heard it, and I heard the cuss words coming out for the first time and then also uh, the sound of things breaking. I just, I felt immediate shock, but also I felt a sense of familiarity because even though I couldn't see Kendrick and the other artists having the argument, I could see a different scene um, play out in my imagination and with the same words being exchanged. Um, so I, I liken it to my neighbors who would party on a Saturday night and they would drink into the early hours of the morning and they'd have a good time. And then out of nowhere, an argument would just break out and the alcohol would sort of like spark the truth to come out. But then next week, um, they will gather again together as though nothing happened. So that song sort of it sort of reminded me of, of situations like that that I've seen play out in my, in my community. So it was definitely the first song that, that captured me. 
um, and that stuck with me and stuck in my memory. But there was also a song called Father Time, which also resonated quite deeply with me. I'm not a man, I don't identify as a man, um, but there were issues that that song, that song touched on that, that I had also been, been wondering for myself as someone who's had a difficult relationship with her father. So those two, I think, were, were sort of the standout songs for me. Yeah, so th thank you for that, because um, those are also some of the, the two songs that, 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 that I pick, Father Time for me especially, um, have a very um, deep resonance, because I didn't grow up with my biological father, but I was raised with my grandfather, so um, it opened a lot of the insecurities, uh, but it also showed me the, the healing up until that point. When I listened to, when I listened to this song, I could realize now, I'm actually a better father. So uh, it's, 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 it's a messed up philosophy, but um, sometimes um, the mistakes of your parents doesn't have to be, be the mistake of, of you. Yeah. So let's talk about um, Auntie Diaries. Um, uh, that specific track um, have caused quite of a stir, especially um, in the LGBTQ community, but before we get into that, um, what is your take on the track? To be honest, I'm, I'm not sure that I have uh, a take on the track. I just know that when I first heard Auntie Diaries, I felt several emotions all at once. So Kendrick opens the song with um, My Auntie's Man. Um, and when I heard that line, I went into shock, but then I also felt immediately uncomfortable because I wasn't sure where he was going with this. Kendrick as a cis man, I wasn't sure where he would take this song. Um, and as someone who is part of the queer community, I think I'm, I'm quite sensitive to cis straight people speaking on queer issues. Um, but I felt immediately immediately uncomfortable, I will say that. My take on the song, I think I'm, I'm in a mixed mindset. I've, I've heard and, and, and read some of um, the commentary that specifically the LGBT community has made on the song. And I, I noted that there's been some debate around the song itself, whether um, it's, it's taking conversations around trans issues forward or whether it's, it's putting up even more barriers and, and stirring even more ignorance um, on trans specific issues. I'm in two minds about whether that is the case. Um, I think that trans people face a number of significant issues um, and challenges in their lives because they are trans. I, they don't have access to, to basic services like healthcare. They um, face issues related to, to safety. They are economically excluded and are more likely than other groups, even within the LGBT community, to be um, poor and displaced. So they have all of these issues and then also the dead naming and the misgendering that he does throughout the songs, trans people face that as well. So these are all very, very violent things that they, that they struggle with, the community struggles with. So that's one very valid critique that people have is that the song is an affront to dignity. And with the repeated misgendering and the repeated use of the, the F slur as well, that it is harmful to them and violent to them. And that's a very valid critique and one that I, that I am inclined to agree with. But then others have also come out saying that this is a song that they feel validates them and they feel seen and they feel heard and recognized. And someone of Kendrick's positionality and influence and power for him to write this song um, makes them feel that they're being seen. Um, and that's also something that I guess I can understand. That is their truth, and that's not something that I can dispute. But it's, it's a very difficult thing to say either I'm on board with the song and I'm in support of the song or I, I'm absolutely, absolutely against the song. Um, it's, it's not an easy, easy thing to sort of say this is where I am. Um, I think it evokes a lot of discomfort, as it rightly should. 
But at the same time, I feel like it might potentially reify some of the harmful language um, that trans people specifically encounter in their life. Thank you. Um, I think um, I want to pick up on um, dead naming because the rejection stems from the dead naming and misgendering um, in, in the song. So why are these, um, these I would say, terms uh, or concepts uh, offensive to the LGBTQ community? See, when you misgender someone or you use a name that they no longer identify with or that no longer or accurately represents them, when you do that, especially intentionally, it communicates a message that firstly, you don't see the person for who they are and that you don't respect them. And it enables a culture of, of hatred and of disrespect and of othering and saying you are not valid, who you are is not valid, you are cosplaying your identity, it is not real and I have the right to, to violate your dignity in that way. So I, yeah, it's, it's the misgendering, it's the dead naming, but it's also the use, the repeated use of the F slur. Um, that all feels very violent, not only I think for the trans community, but for the LGBT community as a whole, who's had to endure othering, especially from, from the hip hop industry, um, where the LGBT community has been demeaned and dehumanized um, on, on several occasions. Um, it all, it's all very, very violent at the end of the day to our dignity, to our sense of worth, to our sense of self. So I, I want to pick up later on, on the hip hop community, but um, before we uh, go there, um, can you please share with, with my audience, and I think the majority of them is kind of heterosexual straight men, because the majority of people on my platform is, is men. What is misgendering and, and dead naming? Because I think this is an important moment of, of, of teaching, of, of educating uh, an audience that, that we can potentially sway and, and inform about many progressive concepts. So to misgender someone means to refer to them using pronouns that they do not identify with. So I identify as she, her, you can also say they, which is, is gender neutral. And if someone either accidentally or intentionally refers to me as a he, where I don't identify as a he, that would be an act of misgendering. And dead naming is, is a similar act as well. So it's, it's the process or the act of referring to someone um, using a name that they do not identify with anymore, um, a name that they've transitioned out of before they stepped into their authentic identity. And again, an example would be, um, I was born as Danielle, but I no longer identify as Danielle because it does not authentically represent who I am. Um, I am now Edwin, for example. And if you keep uh, referring to me as Danielle, that would be an act of using my dead name um, and therefore also implying that you do not see me, you do not respect who I truly am as Edwin. All right, th thank you. Um, I think that that is very helpful. One of the things that um, I think is that a lot of these concepts that is accessible or is being used in the LGBT, LGBTQ community, these concepts are used in that community. And I don't think we have access to, the, to, um, to those concepts. So how do you think um, we can broaden the conversation so it can, it can enter kind of mainstream, um, mainstream conversation? 
I think there is an issue around accessibility of, of these concepts and constructs that refer to the LGBT community. There is an issue, especially when it comes to language, um, because a lot of the language that we use within LGBT spaces is, is English, um, and we're not an English-speaking well, predominantly we're not an English-speaking country. We have several other languages as well. And sometimes these concepts that refer to LGBT issues don't have um, direct translations in our other indigenous language. So there is an issue around the accessibility of language when it comes to understanding LGBTQ-specific issues. I think there's also an issue around the motivation to learn. Um, people in my opinion, speaking as a queer person from where I'm standing, people are not very inclined to learn about LGBTQ issues because they don't see it as something that directly affects them or benefits them in any way, which is, which is sad because if we're looking to create a country that is free from gender-based violence, for example, um, LGBTQ issues would fall within that thematic area. If we're looking to create uh, South Africa where every person is safe regardless of gender or whatever, LGBTQ issues would fall into that area. So ultimately, when we're having conversations about queer issues, everyone should have a vested interest because it will ultimately benefit everyone. Where people need to start is a really good question. I think we need to probably start with being a little bit more self-reflective. The, the cis straight community, but also as the LGBT community, we need to be a little bit more self-reflective on where it is that we are, how it is that we got here, uh, work on understanding ourselves, but also understanding others, doing so with respect and authenticity um, and a willingness to learn and engage. Um, and then from there, I think, to move from self-reflection to actually going out and doing the work. So do the readings, do your research, try and understand what are the issues that especially marginalized communities like the queer community are dealing with and what role it is that you play as a cis straight person in either perpetuating um, harmful practices and behavior or how it is that you can be an ally towards marginalized communities and, and help create a South Africa or a community that is safe for everyone. So, and, and this is where I wanna pick up um, with regards to that, um, because the song, Anti Diaries, um, especially if we think about Kendrick's work, usually in main, um, it shifts mainstream um, hip hop and, and, and rap. And not just hip hop and rap, it shifts the conversation within society, especially if you look at the Black Lives Matters movement, um, where the song All Right was actually used against protests. So that album became such a reality um, during the Black Lives Matter uh, protest. And it, I think it was eight years later. Uh, yeah, about eight, seven years later after the song was released. So it shifts even society. Do you think um, that Auntie's Diary shifted the conversation? Is it helping or is it hurting? To be honest, I can't say if it has shifted conversation, let alone if it's helping or, or hurting. I think from what I have seen, um, and it hasn't been very much, but from what I've seen is that following Auntie Diaries um, and the controversy that the song has, has sparked, there have been several calls for Kendrick to be canceled. Um, and I understand the rationale behind that. But unfortunately, I think that has sort of derailed what could have been a, a moment of reflection and what could have been a meaningful conversation. So now we have people who are calling for Kendrick to be canceled and we have other people defending Kendrick and saying he shouldn't be canceled because he's, he's spoken on trans issues and he's proven himself to be an ally. And you have this back and forth happening between different camps. And I think that's actually derailed the conversation because now trans people are no longer at the forefront. Now what's at the forefront of people's mind is do we cancel Kendrick or not? What's at the forefront of people's mind is a celebrity rather than 
the emotional well-being of a marginalized group of people. So I, I don't know whether it's, it's helped, actually, or, or hindered the conversation. I think you, you're making a great point, is that um, I think seven years back, unknown, just out of the box, Kendrick, um, not with the, the extreme amount of clout, um, is different. Raising a topic uh, is Kendrick now. Pulitzer Prize winner, multiple Grammys. So the, the debate is now not on the issue at hand, but the celebrity. And I think you're, you're making a great point there. So before, for, before we wrap up, um, do you have any final thoughts um, that I might miss in, in this particular conversation um, before I conclude this episode? I think firstly, um, I have to admit on camera that I, I feel quite nervous speaking about trans issues as a cis person. Um, because as much as I try to educate myself on trans issues and I try to be sensitive, I recognize that I might still have biases or or certain parts of me that may be ignorant. Um, and so I'm, I'm inclined to make mistakes. Um, and therefore, I think it's important that when we have conversations about issues that may affect a particular group, that we, we center that group themselves and that they speak for themselves. Um, that thing around passing the mic, I would much rather give this mic to a trans person to speak on this issue than be the one speaking here myself. Um, so that's one thing that I, I would like to say. Another thing that perhaps I would like to add to the conversation, maybe I think this could even be an entirely new conversation that needs to be had is around the role and the purpose of art. What is art supposed to do? Um, what is its intention? So for example, if art is a mirror that reflects to society, back, back reflects back to society what it is, then then is this what Kendrick has done? Has he reflected to society, this is who you are, um, this is the, the flaws that you have? If he's done, if that's, if that's how we interpret art, then I think that the album, um, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, has done it exceptionally well. It's, it's definitely reflected back to society in a very raw, very honest way that this is who you are. It's held up the mirror. But at the same time, we have to caution, I think, against not just holding up the mirror and reflecting back to society, but also provoking that reflection at the same time, that this is who you are, these are the flaws that you have, but this is where you need to improve. Um, so rather than just reifying or uh, reinforcing what already exists, as a mirror would do, also provoking some critical thought, I think. Um, and that's kind of where I think the song might be potentially lacking. So yes, he said that this is the experience of trans people in black communities, and this is what black communities think about trans people and black churches think about trans people. He's held up that mirror and he's done it, he's done it well, I think. He's done it in a very honest way. But has the song itself provoked that, that critical thought like, I might be potentially re reinforcing um, harmful language and harmful behavior in my, in my holding up this mirror. Um, so that's a, a conversation I think we might need to have is around the role and the purpose of art itself. Danielle, thank you. This, um, this conversation is um, very informing and I think it's, it's going to be a classic in, 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 the, coming, in the coming years on a brace of media and especially on the uh, brace of conversations platform. Um, and I hope it starts a conversation and a conversation where we don't shout at each other, but where there is dialogue, where we are able to communicate, where we listen, give each other chances. And once you listen, there's an open communication. I think that's where conflict is avoided, but is also where there is true communication, that's literally where we get things right and get forward in society. Conflict is not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's an opportunity for growth. Um, it's just 
we have to be careful because it's difficult to engage in dialogue if someone dehumanizes you or affronts your dignity. So we need to be mindful that when we engage in dialogue, we don't create a space that, whether intentionally or unintentionally, could feel unsafe for someone or where we invalidate someone's identity by misgendering them, for example, um, because then that's not true authentic dialogue and that's not going to take us anywhere. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you.